Welcome back to Russian Through Propaganda. Today's topic is adjectives. We're on day seven. Uh, first, let's talk a bit about names. Uh, I forgot to mention in the video last time that uh, let's take it again as an example the name Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, right? Uh, first name, patronymic, and last name. And one important point is that uh, Russians uh, would almost never refer to someone by first name only, that is, in this case, by as Alexander. Now, traditionally, and f still today, formally, you would use the first name and the patronymic, right, Alexander Sergeyevich. But um, that's the formal variant. We could call that maybe the V variant. If you're being, if you're on friendly terms with someone and you're using kind of the T variant, though, you wouldn't normally call a friend Alexander. You would call him Sasha, right? So, essentially, for every standard Russian name. There's a standard uh, short form of the name, in this case, Sasha, uh, that you would usually use to address a friend, Alexander, right, when you're using T with them. So these names, we'll, we'll talk more about them later. There is something you just have to know, right? Uh, for example, the short form of Baris is Borya, right? You just have to know that. It's not a, it's not a made-up name. It's not a nickname. It's just a standard short form of that um, Russian name. Um, so uh, we'll talk a, bit, a lot more about that later, and at some point we'll get a list of some of the more common names. But at this point, if you happen to know any Russian friends, you might ask them, uh, you know, what is your, what is the short version of their name? And they can tell you, and that's what you would use to address them. So more on that later. But first, let's talk uh, today about uh, how to ask people's names. And again, here we get a Russian idiom. Remember, when we say idiom in this course, we mean the peculiar way that a given language expresses something. We've already seen this with possession, right? In, in Russian, we don't say, I have a book. We say, a book is at me, right? So it's a totally different grammatical construction, a totally different idiom. And we've talked about how you always have to be on guard uh, in terms of not... A, thinking of Russian through the English lens, right? Through the lens of English idioms. And some of these habits can be very hard to break, but as we're going through the grammar, I'll take great care, believe me, to point out which uh, idioms are the tricky ones and uh, which cause the most trouble. Um, basically, the idiom for talking about names is they call someone something. So we use this they call, right? Not what is your name, but what, or literally, how do they call you? How do they call you? Right? So obviously, it means essentially the same thing, but the idiom is different. For example, как вас зовут? Or, как тебя зовут? Again, there's the V versus T distinction, right? So if we're being polite, we would say, как вас зовут? How do they call you? Uh, friendly or uh, uh, informal, using T. Как тебя зовут? Okay, since the you in this, in either case, is the direct object of the verb they call, we're using uh, the pronoun in the accusative case. We're going to learn more about the accusative uh, soon, I think in chapter two, I don't remember exactly. Uh, but uh, for now, we'll just learn these pronoun forms, uh, just to use in this very useful expression, right? Uh, so the answer is, меня зовут whatever, right? They call me, again, now we're using ya in the accusative, which is minya. The accusative case is generally used in Russian for direct objects. Uh, so, for example, minya zavut Ivan, or minya zavut Mark. Let's look over the uh, accusative forms of these pronouns in the table. We see that um, ya, that's the nominative case, we're going to use that for subjects in Russian. And we've already seen the genitive construction, umiña, umiña. Now, it just so happens it, for these pronouns that the accusative form is the same as the genitive. So uh, we're just kind of lucky in that respect at this point, right? So the accusative of ya is minya. Minya zavut mark, right? They call me mark. Ty, we saw utibya. Uh, right at you to express possession, and now we're using tibia all by itself as a direct object, right? Kak tibia zavut? Kak tibia zavut? How do they call you? What's your name? Now, for the uh, third singular pronouns, on, ana, anoa, the only change here is we drop the N. We'll talk a lot more about this later. The N 
is being added here um, to these forms that follow a preposition, right? So because of the ooh, that preposition ooh, that's why we're adding the n. Uh, so we just drop that n and we have our basic accusative forms of the pronouns, right? From one, we get yvo. Note the pronunciation yvo, right? The g is pronounced like a v. Uh, rather unusual, but we'll see the same um, exception in other forms. Uh, uh, Anyway, we'll talk more about that later. Anna becomes ye your, ye your. Anno, it, also becomes ye vor. And we won't really be using that right now since we're talking about people and uh, people's names. Mui, we've seen unas. Now we get just the accusative nas. Vui becomes vas, kak vas zavut, what they call you, polite. And finally, Third plural, ani, becomes ich, ich. Okay, let's do it. Uh, exercise 7a and just fill in some blanks here, right? Taking the nominative forms of the pronoun that are given to you and making them accusative, right? To say, uh, how do they call you or them or him or her and so forth. Okay, so follow the model there. Kaki vo zavut. Kaki vo zavut. Uh, or another question, now there's the question, how are things at him? How are matters at him? That's how we ask, how, how are things going? Uh, okay, so let's start with, and then the final example, right, things are going very well. He has a new car. A new car is at him, right? So again, that idiom of possession, plus the genitive. So for number one, let's take Anna, Anna, and we want to say here, how do they call her? Kak yiyo zavut, kak yiyo zavut, right? How do they call her? Again, we're putting it into the accusative. Now, to use u, we need the, this genitive form, right, uh, that we've already learned. Kak u nyiyo, kak u nyiyo yila. Oji and now we want to say she has a new lamp, right? Things are going great for her. She's got a, a, a sweet new lamp. U nyo yest nova lampa. U nyo yest nova lampa. Okay, let's take I ni, right? <clears throat> so we're saying literally, how do they call them? What is what are their names? Kak ich zavut. Kak ich zavut. Kak ich zavut. Uh, how are things going for them? How are matters at them? Kakunich dila. Kakunich dila. And finally, Ocean Khrashua. Unich yest novi shampoo. They've got some new sham shampoo. Things are fantastic, right? Unich yest novi shampoo. Number three, let's use thi, right? And ask again informally, how do they call you? Kak. Tibia zavut. How are things with you? How are things at you? Kak u tibia dila. Kak u tibia dila. Ochen chrashua. U. Okay, now to answer this question, we want to use a. Uh, I have something, right? Uh, so let's use the genitive of ya. That would be minya. U minya yes nova adiyala. I've got a new blanket. Очень хорошо. У меня есть новое одеяло. By the way, if we look at this poster, Родина мать зовет. We see the same verb, зовут, right, which we were using earlier in the third plural. They call me. What do they call you? Here we have it in the third singular, right? She calls. She is calling. Родина мать. Родина means uh, motherland. Uh, well, literally something more like land of one's birth, right? So homeland or motherland or literally land of one's birth. And here we have it in this hyphenated form, mat, right? So you may translate that as the motherland or literally the homeland mother or our mother, the our homeland is calling us, right? Zaviot. By the way, we'll introduce verbs in chapter two. So don't worry too much about this form right now. It's just for fun. Yeah, the next little topic is one that plagues the lives of first-year Russian students. Uh, they're usually referred to as spelling rules. Uh, spelling rules, uh, of which, thank God, there are only three. Only three spelling rules. Um, 
We're going to call them the seven letter rule, the five letter rule, and the four letter rule. Um, okay, so first thing to note is that again, there are only three of these and they're universally valid in Russian. That means they, uh, with very, very few exceptions, these are always going to be true. So this isn't just limited to today's topic. Uh, we're going to see today how they affect adjectival endings and the spelling of adjectival endings. But again, these same rules are going to be, we're going to be applying them constantly. Uh, and so they'll keep kind of rearing their heads or and we'll realize we've forgotten the spelling rule and we'll have to think about it. Now in time, uh, this becomes kind of intuitive. So it's one of those troublesome things. You're starting a language, you kind of have to memorize a rule very mechanically. Later, it will just kind of become uh, second nature. Essentially, a spelling rule tells us which letter combinations can never occur in Russian. And by extension, of course, that means that certain sound combinations can't occur. So each, each rule tells us first what we can't write and then what we have to write instead. Uh, now, the, the, there are seven letters involved in, in, in these three rules, uh, namely four hushings. That would be zh, ch, sh, sh. Okay, how can you remember that? What's a hushing? Well, just think of the sound sh, right? Okay, so that kind of quality, uh, you see how they all, all these, all four of these letters share that hushing quality, zh, ch, sh, sh. Okay, so we've got four hushings, and then we've got three velars, right? A velar is a sound made at the back of your, kind of in your throat. So, g, ka, Kh, right? G, kh, 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 right? Just make all those sounds. You can tell where they're being made. That may help you keep them, uh, uh, you know, memorize them, right? These three velars. And then what I usually call the odd man out, which is s, right? Uh, so four, three, and one. Okay, so try to file that away. Now, the first rule is the seven letter rule. Okay, how do we get seven? Uh, well, four plus three. Okay, so it's pretty obvious, right? But this can help you remember the rule. So we've got the four velars plus, sorry, the four hushing consonants plus the three velars. That gives us our seven letters for the seven letter spelling rule. The seven letter spelling rule tells us that we can't write U. We cannot write U after those seven letters. Instead, we need to write E, right? Not U, but E. Okay, the five letter rule is uh, just one degree trickier because it involves stress. Okay, so five letter spelling rule, how do we get five? Four, right, the four hushings plus the one odd man out, the tz. Okay, so the four hushings, zh, ch, sh, sh, plus the odd man out, tz, that gives us five. The five letter rule tells us that we cannot write an unstressed o, an unstressed o, after those five letters. Instead, we write yeah. Okay, so that one, again, is a bit trickier because you've got to, you're worried about stress, right? A, a stressed or is fine, but an unstressed or we can't have. Um, okay, so let's file that away for a moment and talk some about adjectives, and then we'll see specific ways in which these two rules are affecting the way we write and say the endings of adjectives. Um, now, again, there's a, there's a third rule that we're going to add, I think, in Chapter 2. It'll come up fairly soon, and that'll be it. There'll be no more spelling rules, but these things are going to be constantly affecting how we're writing words and how we're saying them. Um, okay, so let's talk about adjectives. Today, we're still looking mostly at the nominative case for nouns and adjectives. We covered nouns last time. Today, we get to adjectives. And as we've glimpsed already, adjectives have gender, right? So they're going to be changing their endings. Uh, to reflect the gender of whatever noun they're modifying, right? So they agree with the noun they modify in terms of uh, gender uh, and also number, by the way, and eventually case, right? So there are these three uh, aspects of agreement in Russian. Right now, we're really just worried about gender because we're only talking about the nominative case. Okay, we've seen these endings already. Let's just read through the table to get more practice. Make sure that you're pronouncing all the vowels, right? There, there are no silent E's or no, sol no silent yes, we should say in Russian. So let's read through this list of some basic adjectives. New is novy, novy, novaya, novaya. 
old as stari, stari, stare, stare. A boring masculine is skuchni, skuchnaya, that's the feminine, and neuter skuchnaya, skuchnaya. Okay, so you see how the endings are changing to reflect the three different genders. Uh, favorite, or literally beloved, or loved, is Lubimli, Lubimaya, Lubimaya. Hard or difficult, Trudni. It's related to Trud, which means labor. Trudnaya, Trudnaya. Now you're probably noticing, as you may recall, that because of vowel reduction, the feminine and neuter forms sound very similar. Uh, the only real difference is that we're not reducing the final yeah. Remember that? So, trudnaya, uh, trudnaya, right? Those are both reducing to uh, but then the neuter, trudnaya, trudnaya, right? We're getting a final yeah that's not reduced. But if you're speaking at a normal speed, that difference is very subtle. It's, it's very hard to hear. Um, strange. Stranly. Stranaya. Stranaya. Clean. Chistly. Chistaya. Chistaya. Dirty. Gryazny. Gryaznaya. Grazna Cheap uh Dishovy Dishovaya Dishovaya Awful Ujasni Ujasnaya Ujasnaya Huge is Agromni Agromnaya Agromnaya Excellent or great, atlichni, atlichnaya, atlichnaya. Hideous or awful, bizabrazni, bizabraznaya, bizabraznaya. Important, vajni, vajnaya, vajnaya. Not pretty. Uh, okay, well, let's learn pretty first. Pretty would be krasivli, krasivaya, krasivaya. And we can negate that by adding a, a nya in front of it, right? And writing it as one word. Nya krasivli, nya krasivaya, nya krasivaya. Uh, same thing with usual or, or, or maybe ordinary. Abichni, abichnaya, abichnaya. Add a nya in front of it and you get unusual. Nyabuichni, nyabuichnaya, nyabuichnaya. Interesting. Interiasni, interiasnaya, interiasnaya. At a nya in front, you get uninteresting. Okay, so uh, let's try plugging in a few of these adjectives. Now, um, for reasons we'll discuss in a moment, uh, you're usually going to be fed adjectives in the masculine singular, right? So, uh, and that's the case in exercise 7b, right? Novi, stari, interiasni, right? Those are the masculine singular forms. But of course, if we're using them to modify a feminine or a neuter noun, we're going to have to change the ending, right? We always have to have agreement in terms of gender between adjectives and the nouns they modify. So let's just plug in uh, the right forms here. Okay, kniga is feminine, so we'll say new book will be Novaya Kniga. Novaya Kniga. A new museum, that's masculine, would be Novi Muse. A new shirt, again feminine. Novaya, or with reduction Novaya, Novaya Rubashka. A new dress, here's a neuter. Uh, Platia, right? Ends in, a, ends in a yeah, that's a soft neuter. Novoye platia. Novoye platia. You may notice me sometimes uh, doing these drills, and Russian instructors will do the same. Uh, they may read a word as though it were 
without reducing the vowels, right? Because again, that will make the spelling clear. So if I want to make crystal clear what we're actually writing, that would be no voyeur, right? No voyeur platia. But that's not what we say, right? We say no voyeur platia, right? We reduce, and again, that obscures somewhat the, the spelling. So listen for that uh, in class, right, in these videos. A new backpack, masculine, novi rukzak, novi rukzak, no change. A new idea, that's soft feminine, idea. So, novoye idea, novoye idea. And again, without reduction, that would be novaya, novaya idea, but we say novoye idea. Okay, some old things, an old ball, stary miach, an old room, staraya, staraya konata, a new dictionary, Stari Slavar, right, a soft masculine noun, Slavar. A new blanket or cover that's neuter, so we need Staroye, but we say Staroye Adiala. A new poster, uh, sorry, old poster. Stari Plakat, right, no change because it's masculine. Uh, a new car, sorry, an old car. Staroye Mashina. Starrea Mashima. Okay, let's describe some things that's interesting. Interesting question, that's masculine, so no change. Interesnly vapros. An interesting answer, again masculine. Interesnly at viet. An interesting uh, assignment. Interesnaya zadacha. Okay, that one's feminine, so we've got to change it to interesnaya. An interesting story. The word historia can mean history or a story. So it's feminine, so we need interesnaya historia. Interesnaya historia. An interesting uh, place, neuter. Interesnaya miesta. Again, we're writing interesnoye, right, to match the neuter uh, gender of the noun, but we're saying interesnaya miesta. An interesting painting or picture, interesnaya cartina, aya for feminine. Okay, now let's talk about some variations, right? What we've seen here so far, just ordinary, run-of-the-mill, uh, hard adjectives. Uh, so the vast majority of adjectives will look like that, but uh, because of the spelling rule, we have what we can think of as exceptions, right? Uh, first, we have three just very basic everyday adjectives that are affected by the seven letter spelling rule. So in the table, you can see the always look for the black box. That's usually pointing out what's important or what's unusual about some given forms. The masculine forms here are the ones affected by the seven letter spelling rule. Right? Now see what happens. Normally we would write ui ikratkaya uh, for the masculine ending. But the seven letter rule tells us we can't write ui after uh, the four hushings and the three velars. Okay, ka, 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 ka. We make that in our throat. That's a velar. So we can't write the u after that letter. So we get marinki, marinki. Okay, now note that that's not only a spelling convention. It's telling us also about what's actually said, right? So this isn't just some kind of um, artificial uh, rule, right? We don't say marinki. Right, we say marinki, e e e, not u. Okay, but the other forms are unaffected, right? Marinkaya, marinkaya, right? Uh, no change. Same thing with lyorki, right? Again with the ka. Uh, lyorki, lyorkaya, lyorkaya. Ruski, again with the ka, right? Can't have an u after that velar. Ruski. Ruskaya, Ruskaya. Now we have one uh, even more tricky uh, adjective, Haroshi, for good. That's affected by the seven and the five letter rule. Okay, so the, the first in the masculine, we have the same problem we had before, right? Haroshi, sh is a hushing, right? How do we get to seven? Four hushings plus the three velars, right? We can't have u after any of those seven letters. 
Instead, we write e, and that's what we end up with here. Haroshi, haroshi. Feminine, harosha, that's fine. But now we get to the neuter. Remember, the five-letter spelling rule tells us that after the four hushings, plus the one odd man out, the tz, we can't write an unstressed or. And that's what we're trying to do here. Look at the stress. Harosh, right? The stress is on the, on the stem, not on the ending. So we can't write oya here. We can't have that unstressed o after the hushing consonant. So you see how that five-letter spelling, spelling rule is telling us we have to write ye instead of o. That gives us the ending ye ye. Okay, so for now, just try to, you might want to circle this adjective haroshi and just memorize these forms and just take note. This is the first, the seven-letter rule, seven letter rule and the five-letter rule. And uh, if you focus on these initial examples of the rules, it'll help you down the road a lot. Okay, so let's try applying some of these uh, somewhat trickier adjectives here to describe nouns. Okay, a Russian poster would be Ruski plakat, no change, right? Uh, masculine. A Russian book, feminine, Ruskaya kniga, aya, feminine. A serial, a television series, uh, that's masculine, so Ruski serial. A Russian car, uh, feminine, Ruskaya Mashima, Ruskaya Mashima, Aya, feminine. Uh, a Russian last name, Familia. Remember, that doesn't mean family, it means last name. Uh, well, it's feminine, so we'd say Ruskaya Familia, Aya. Finally, a Russian first name, Imya. Remember, that's neuter despite looking like a feminine noun. We, we've pointed out that exception. So this would be Ruskoye. Right, neuter, ruskaya imya. Let's talk about some small things, a small mistake, feminine. Malinkaya ashibka, aya for feminine. Uh, a little umbrella, zont, that's masculine, so malinki zont. A small window, neuter. Malinkoye, right, malinkaya aknoa. A small family, feminine, simya, malinkaya simya, aya. A small carpet, uh, malinki kavior, malinki kavior. A small table, another um, masculine noun, malinki stol. Okay, now let's take haroshi and again pay attention to the spelling, especially when we come across a neuter. A good museum, Haroshi Musier, no change. A good idea, now a feminine, Idea, Haroshi Idea, Aya is our ending. A good uh, place, or Miesta can also mean a seat in a theater. That make, might make more sense here, a good seat in a theater, literally a good place. Okay, that's a neuter, so it's Haroshi Idea. Right, don't write or oh, yeah, right? We can't have that because of the five letter spelling rule. So the ending on your adjective is yeah, yeah. Harosheya miesta. A good job or good work. Harosheya rabota, aya. A good question. Harosheya vapros. And a good dictionary. Harosheya slavar. Okay, so no change there, but again, make sure you're writing e instead of u. Okay, one more type of adjective, uh, in-stressed adjectives. So we'll be talking a lot about stress patterns in Russian. And one basic distinction is between words that are stressed somewhere on the stem versus words that are stressed on the ending. Uh, it could be a noun ending or, in this case, an adjectival ending. Okay, so when an adjective happens to be in-stress, then in the masculine singular, uh, we don't write uy. Instead, we write oi. So oi is the masculine ending for unstressed adjectives. But uh, if we look at the remaining forms, we see they're ordinary. The only difference is the stress is on the ending, but there's no change to the spelling or the pronunciation of the, well, the, the nature of the ending itself. It's just simply stressed. Uh, now, of course, if, if a vowel is stressed, it's not going to be reduced, right? So we're going to hear in this case, I, uh, we're going to hear much more distinctly 
uh, how these endings are actually written when they are stressed. Um, okay, let's look at look at the table. Just read through some examples. Bad, masculine, plachoi, plachoi. Okay, note the stress on that ending. Feminine, plachaya, and neuter, plachoya. Okay, big, balshoi. Okay, take a moment uh, to circle that ending. A lot of people think, oh, that not that a violation of the five-letter spelling rule? No, it's not, because here we're adding a stressed or. Right, so see the difference between that front, between Balshoi and Haroshi, right? Here we've got stress on the ending, so there's nothing wrong with writing a stressed O in this position, and so we do, and we get Balshoi. Balshoi, Balshaya, Balshoya. Uh, expensive. Dragoi, Dragoi, Dragaya, Dragoya. A different or another drugoi drugaya drugoya funny smishnoi smishnaya smishnoya okay let's add a few of these to to some nouns okay let's say we have a big backpack rugzak is masculine so balshoi rugzak Bashoi Rugzak. A big problem. Bashaya problema. Bashaya problema. Feminine. A big a carpet. Okay, Kavior is masculine, so we'd say Bashoi Kavior. Bashoi Kavior. A big window, neuter. That'll be Bashoya Aknoa. Bashoya Aknoa. I guess some expensive things, expensive soap, muela, that's neuter, so that would be dragoya muela, dragoya muela. Expensive shampoo, okay, that's a soft masculine. So we'd go with dragoy shampoo. Expensive paper, feminine. Dragaya bumaga, dragaya bumaga. An expensive pen, dragaya ruchka, feminine, dragaya ruchka. Okay, let's have some bad things like a bad day. Dien is masculine, soft masculine. So we get plachoi dien, plachoi dien. A bad week, feminine, plachaya nidelia, plachaya nidelia. A bad newspaper. Plachaya Gazeta. Plachaya Gazeta. And bad soap. Plachoya uh, Muela. Plachoya Muela. Uh, by the way, you'll notice in the book uh, that I've strewn some uh, bits of Russian folk wisdom uh, amongst the, uh, the exercises. So sometimes when you get to the end of an exercise, you'll be rewarded with a nice little paslovitsa. That's the Russian word for a kind of folk saying, paslovitsa, or a proverb. And uh, the one here is one of my favorites, durnoye djela nikhitre. Durnoye djela nikhitre. Okay, why did I put that here? Usually I'll, I'll try to choose them to illustrate something that we're actually talking about. And here we have a neuter noun, djela. And we're using two adjectives to talk about it. A durnoye djela, that means a bad deed or bad doings, and now we get a predicate adjective, nihitreya, not clever. A bad deed is not clever, is kind of the literal translation. And the sense, more or less, is that it doesn't demand any great genius to go around wrecking things and doing bad, nasty things to people, right? It's, it's, uh, so um, you see, by the way, that durnoi is an unstressed adjective. Durnoi djela nihitreya. Uh, okay, let's move on to uh, 7.5 uh, and talk about the question word kakoi. Okay, so kakoi is a, another important question word, and we see that it's an adjective. It is an unstressed adjective, just like balshoi, balshaya, balshoya. 
we have kakoi, kakaya, kakoye. And depending on what we're asking about, what noun we're referring to, we have to change the ending of this question word. It's an adjective, so like any adjective, we have to change the ending to match the gender of what we're talking about. Um, so look at these examples. What if we want to what if we want to ask about a movie, a, a film, film? Okay, that's masculine in Russian. So we'd say kakoi at the film, kakoi at the film. What kind of movie is this? Now remember the eta here is just the pointing word. Right, film is the subject of the of the uh, sentence of the question in this case. Okay, let's look at some answers. And again, as we answer these questions, we're still still talking about film, which is grammatically masculine. So any adjective we use to talk about to answer this question and to talk about a, a film is going to have to be masculine. At the Ruski film, on interesny, da очень interesny. Какая это книга? Okay, now we're in feminine mode. Это русская книга. Она трудная? Нет, не очень трудная. Okay, now let's do a neuter. Пальто. Okay, so we've got to use neuters everywhere. Какое это пальто? What kind of coat is this? Это русское пальто. Оно дорогое? Is it expensive? Нет, дешевое. Now, no, by the way, when we use it, right, on, ana, ano, the word it is also, of course, matching the gender of whatever it is we're talking about. Uh, now, you see that when you ask this question, kakoi, which is an adjective, you're expecting usually an adjective in response, right? So, kakoi at the film, at the ruski film, or at the plachoi film, or at the skushni film, at the interesni film, right? Anything we say about film. It's got to be masculine. So I have some free advice for everyone. Uh, don't dry clothes that have been washed with gasoline near a flame. Okay. So, you know, students sometimes ask me, are these posters real? Yeah, they're real as far as I know. And the scary part is this isn't a joke. This, this apparently, you know, must have been based on some actual workplace uh, accident, right? So people were trying to do this. It sounds pretty stupid, but uh, someone served as the unfortunate uh, impetus behind this, the creation of this uh, work safety poster. And the next exercise, by the way, is mostly for conversation, right? So we won't always do these in the videos uh, uh, since it's kind of based on your own, or just telling about yourself, uh, but Look at the example, какая у тебя комната? Okay, so we're asking about someone's room, which is feminine. And then we're giving them a couple of options. Хорошая или плохая? Is it good or bad? And to give an answer, we'd say, комната у меня хорошая. Or, of course, simply, хорошая, right, would be the shortest answer to that question. So you can practice that some yourself and just make sure you're using the right endings. Of course, in this case, they're supplied for you. We can also use kakoi in exclamation. So this is heard quite often in Russian. For example, they'll say kakoi ujus, which means what horror, right? So they'll say that when something terrible has happened. Kakoi ujus, right? Oh my God, what horror. Um, or we could say other things like kakaya harosha idea, right? What a good idea. Now again, look at how all, how all three of those words are feminine, right? Both of the adjectives are modifying and agreeing with idea. Какой большой зонт, right? What a big umbrella. Какая у тебя грязная комната. Okay, now, there we've thrown in an у тебя to express possession, right? What a dirty room you have. Okay, uh, now here are a few more expressions. Какой ужас, какой ужас. Какой кошмар, какой кошмар. What a nightmare. Uh, Какая ерунда. What nonsense. Какая ерунда. What a mess. Какое безобразие. And безобразие can mean all sorts of things. Just something unbelievably shameless or horrible or hideous. What an idiot. Какой идиот. Какой идиот. Какой он идиот. Right? What an idiot he is. And what's the difference? Какая разница. Какая разница? 
literally, yeah, what difference in the sense of, you know, who cares? What difference does it make? Okay, let's string together the word kakoi with a couple of adjectives to say what a X and Y, whatever, right? So let's say what's combined dragoi, balshoi, and machina to say what an expensive and big car. Kakai dragaya i balshai machina. Kakai dragaya i balshai machina. Okay, let's say what an old and interesting poster. Okay, this one is masculine, so we don't have to change very much, right? Kakoi starri i interesni plakat. Kakoi starri i interesni plakat. Okay, now let's do a neuter platia. Kakoi krasivaya i neobichnaya platia. Okay, so we're writing o ye for all those adjectives. Kakoi krasivoye i neobichnoye platia. Or again, in the spoken, correct spoken version of that. Какое красивое и необычное платье. What a good and clean cafeteria. Okay, this one's masculine, so this is an easy one. Какой хороший и чистый кафетерий. What a terrible and boring film. Also masculine. Какой ужасный и скучный фильм. Какой ужасный и скучный фильм. Uh, what an unusual and interesting idea. Okay, feminine. So we want aya everywhere, right? Какая необычная и интересная идея. Okay, so again, we're reducing that ending when it's unstressed, but we're writing everywhere aya. Какая необычная и интересная идея. What an old and hideous photograph. Um, this reminds me of a photograph my grandmother had in her little stack of old of memories, right? There's no telling when this photo was taken, but it was like of her grandmother lying in her coffin. <laughs> we always laughed about what, what a horrible photograph. Why do you have this lying around? It gave us all the creeps. Okay, so I thought of that when I was writing this example. Какая старая и безобразная фотография. Okay, so again, feminine, I, ya, everywhere. Okay, one more. What a little and dirty window. Какое маленькое и грязное окно. Okay, so again, we're writing о, ya, everywhere. Какое маленькое и грязное окно. Okay, by the way, we if you look at this table in 7.7, .7, right, just a way to think about grouping adjectives in pairs of opposites. So this is really just for study purposes, but it might help you when you're studying vocabulary. Don't just memorize it as some meaningless jumble of letters. Try to really use your imagination to associate the feeling or the thing referred to as you're repeating the word and practicing it, right? Uh, it's a fairly obvious tip, I guess, but it can really help. And part of that, I think, is just is something kind of positive or negative, right? Like when you say the word bad and you're practicing plachoy, well, then feel it. Plachoy, plachoy. Think of something that, that's bad or terrible, right? Or maybe a good, right? Haroshi, haroshi, right? Think positive and try to really uh, make an association between the feeling and the sound of the, the new Russian word you're trying to learn. That'll be a big help, actually. Okay, let's do exercise 7F. So we're just uh, getting more questions with adjectives, and we're going to answer with the opposite, with some negative uh, adjective. Uh, for example, computer novi. So is it new? No, let's say it's it's old, unfortunately. And the person will respond with, what horror? Нет, он старый, к сожалению. Какой ужас. Комната у тебя большая? Нет, она маленькая, к сожалению. It's small. Какой ужас. Number two. Uh, телефон у тебя хороший? Is your telephone good? Нет, он плохой. Он плохой, к сожалению. It's bad. К сожалению. Какой ужас. Number three. Машина у тебя дорогая? Is your car expensive? Uh, no, let's say it's uh, cheap. 
Нет, она дешевая, к сожалению. Какой ужас! Number four, is your backpack beautiful? Is it, do you have a pretty backpack? Рюкзак у тебя красивый? Нет, он некрасивый, к сожалению. Or we could go a step further and say uh, безобразный. Right, I have a hideous, horrible backpack. Какой ужас! Number five, кафетерий у тебя хороший? Is your cafeteria good? Нет, он плохой. No, it's bad. Он плохой, к сожалению. Какой ужас. Number six. Окно у тебя большое? Окно у тебя большое? Is your window big? Нет, оно маленькое, к сожалению. It's small. Какой ужас. Number seven. Is your assignment easy? Задание у тебя легкое? Нет, оно трудное. Оно трудное, к сожалению. Какой ужас! You may have noticed in some of these examples that the uh, linking verb есть is typically omitted in Russian. We've mentioned this before. Um, now, what is is? Uh, well, we call that a linking verb, right? So a linking verb links the subject of the sentence with whatever it is we're saying about it, right? A, a predicate noun or an adjective, right? Uh, like the car is new. Uh, now, if we're asking a question like, do you have a car, th the very existence of the thing is in question, right? So kind of the point of that question is the is, right? So if is, that linking verb is being emphasized, if it's sort of the point of the question or of the statement, then we do include it, right? We say, у тебя есть машина? У тебя есть машина? Uh, but if we assume that someone already has a car and we're going to ask, use an adjective to ask what kind of car is it or is it such and such a car, then the point isn't the existence of the car. That's already assumed. The, the issue is something else, like what kind of car is it. Right, so that explains why we're asking, какая у тебя машина? Right, omitting the yeast. Or машина у тебя новая? Okay, that is, is your car new? That assumes you have a car, and we're now asking about what kind of car it is. Mashima uh, tibia novaya. But let's look at one more example. Utibia yeast krasna ruchka. Okay, there the yeast is included in the question. That means the point of this question is do you have a red pen? Right? Not is your pen red, but do you have a red pen? Does it exist at all? Uh, sometimes in formal Russian, you can write a what's called a tire, uh, which is a long dash, in the place of a uh, a linking verb. Right. So here are a couple of examples. Моя любимая русская книга Война и мир. Right. My favorite Russian book is War and Peace. Okay. So you see how the long dash is 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 kind of filling in visually for the linking. Uh, Verb. Vaina i mir et veliki ruski roman. War and Peace. It's a great Russian novel, right? Uh, War and Peace is a great Russian novel, sort of here giving a definition of what War and Peace is with the dash followed by eta. And time for another poster. This is an anti religion poster, right? This girl wants to go to school. You see there, Shkola. Uh, and her retrograde grandmother is trying to drag her back to church. And the inscription, uh, which like a lot of these inscriptions, it, it rhymes. Religia yat right? That Now, that's a good example because of the devoicing de of the of the de, right? That final D in yad, which means poison, rhymes very nicely with ribyat, right? Yat, yat. Uh, both of those endings are pronounced the same, or the... the final portion of those words. Okay, so anyway, Rigia Yad, there you see the the dash. Now here graphically it looks like almost like a little short hyphen, but it's really not. It's the long dash. Religion is poison. Protect children, right? Protect the children. Rigia Yad Virigi Ribyat. So to conclude today's lesson, let's continue our little walking tour of the center of Moscow and uh, go inside the Kremlin. Uh, to get there, we have to walk away from Red Square and kind of turn the corner here, and that brings us to this 
a shopping center with a bunch of fountains you see down there depicting various fairy tales, Russian fairy tales. Uh, so the entrance, the main entrance for tourists into the uh, Kremlin, or Kremlin, is there where you see the red tower. That where the, that's where the gate is that you'll enter by. Uh, this shopping center is called the Akhotny Ryad, and this structure is fairly new. I think it's maybe twenty or twenty-five years old, uh, but the name Akhotny Ryad is older. Um, uh, anyway, it's also the name of a. Uh, subway station that's that's there at this location as well and you see that big white building is the manege that's the old riding hall which is today a place for exhibitions and things of that nature uh, and this garden is called the alexandrovsky sad uh, now here's the gate we'll walk through this is the troitskaya bashnya uh, the the trinity tower and this is, again, the main tourist entrance if you want to see the churches and the, the heart of the, the uh, historical Kremlin. Uh, there are two other things that are somewhat under the radar, I think, for a lot of tourists. One is called the Diamond Fund, in Russian, Almazny Fond, and the Armory Chamber, the Rzhenna Palata. Uh, the Diamond Fund is basically a collection of, of jewels, uh, including some of the Russian crown jewels, uh, some of them. And then the Rzhenna Palata is the more impressive uh, exhibit. It's got just basically all of the old things of the the, the, the ruling dynasty. Uh, the, the Shapka Manamacha, which is kind of the original Russian crown, uh, all sorts of dresses and carriages and thrones and... Uh, armor, it, uh, Fabergé eggs, it, you just could go on and on talking about all this stuff in the Rouge and La Palata. But there's there uh, there's only a limited number of tickets sold on any day for that. So you should kind of think about it ahead of time if you're going to be in Moscow and make plans to get to the ticket window early and be sure and get your ticket. Anyway, here's where you walk through into the uh, Kremlin, you see on the right there, one of the few really modern buildings or, or truly Soviet-era buildings in the Kremlin. That's the Gosudarstvene Kremlyovsky Dvoryets, which was built in 1961. Um, so that was where the, uh, again, rather starting in the 60s, where the Communist Party Congresses would be held. But today it's main, mainly just a performance venue. Uh, we see right as we enter the Kremlin some cannons captured from the French armies when Napoleon invaded uh, Russia in 1812. Uh, by the way, that conflict was called the Atyechstvenaya Vaina, the Fatherland War, and uh, that explains in part why the why World War II uh, was called the Great Fatherland War, Velikaya Atyechstvenaya Vaina, right, Velikaya, to distinguish it from the earlier Atyechstvenaya Vaina, the earlier Fatherland War. Uh, this is the Kremlin Senate, or the Senate Palace in Russian, Senatsky Dvoryets. Uh, so some of the um, Soviet uh, rulers had their offices here, uh, Lenin and Stalin as well. Um, this is the Tsar Pushka, the gigantic king of cannons, right? The Tsar of all cannons. And we also have here the king of all bells, the Tsar Kolokol, this gigantic bell that uh, split, as you can see there, and was never actually rung. Um, anyway, if we move on, speaking of bells, here's the Kolokolne Ivana Velikova, the bell tower of Ivan the Great, uh, rather imposing tower. Next to it is the Uspienska Zvonitsa, the Assumption Belfry, so more bells. By the way, if you want to learn more about um, how to cast a bell, uh, watch the Tarkovsky film, Andrei Rublev. Uh, the final segment of that film is this uh, kind of mind-blowing uh, depiction of how, how a bell was cast, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful, very moving scene. I uh, highly recommend it. Anyway, at the top of the bell tower, we see some inscriptions that are not actually Russian. These are Church Slavonic. So we'll talk about Church Slavonic every now and again, especially in uh, second year material. Uh, but 
Let's just note for now that it, it's a different language from Russian, it, and but still today it's the liturgical language of the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, so it would be something like if you went in a church service uh, in the U.S. or England or whatever, and the service was conducted in Old English, or well, let's say Middle English, Middle English, right? So a more archaic uh, form of um, of your language. Now we get to the cluster of cathedrals inside the Kremlin walls. I'll just give you pictures of a few of these. The Virchaspaisky Sabor, the Uspiensky Sabor, which is where the coronations took place even after the capital was moved to uh, St. Petersburg in 1703. Uh, the, uh, yeah, this, yeah, this is the entrance to the Uspiensky Sabor, the Cathedral of the Dormition. This is the Archangelsky Sabor, the Ar Cathedral of the Archangel. And this is where the Tsars and other important uh, figures were buried until the capital was moved to Petersburg, starting with Peter the Great, uh, Pyotr Pierri, all the Russian Tsars after him and including him are buried in the Petropavlovsky Kriepis, the Peter and Paul fortress in St. Petersburg. And finally, the Blagavieshinsky Sabor, the Cathedral of the Annunciation. There are also some gardens there in the Kremlin. You can see the bell tower there in the in the distance, up in the upper right-hand corner. And they're now looking back at the whole uh, cathedral complex. And finally, now we've come full circle, right? We're back at the Spaskaya Bashnya, right, the Savior Tower, but now from the opposite direction. And you can just barely see the two spires of the Goom, right? So that gives you some idea where right beyond that wall is Lenin's Mausoleum and Red Square and uh, St. Basil's, which I think here is obscured by the trees. I think you would be able to see, yeah, you would certainly be able to see that if it weren't for the trees. Um, and you see the uh, distinctive red star at the top of the tower. Now this, this looming gigantic red star is going to come up later in our poetry section when we read Akhmatova. So you might want to file that away for future reference. Okay, anyway, that's it, that's it for today's lesson. Um, until next time, to Svidani Tavarishi.